this discourse was the first discourse given by uh, Ahsoka's son. Ahsoka's son was an arahat. Can't think of his name right off, unfortunately. But this is one of the favorite uh, discourses in Sri Lanka because it was the first. The second discourse was uh, the smaller, smaller discourse on the simile of the elephant's footprint that was given by his daughter, who was an arahat. So, it's cold here. I'm walking in the cold always takes my breath away, so it takes a minute. Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Sawati in Jetta's Grove, Anath and Pandika's Park. There the venerable Sariputta addressed the monks thus, friends. Friend, they replied, the venerable Sariputta said this. This is how they addressed themselves in the Sangha, just as friend. It didn't matter whether they were a senior monk or a junior monk. They were called a wuso, friend. When the Buddha was on his uh, dying day. He told Ananda that the senior monks need to be called Bhante. And that's what I go by. And a lot of people think that's my first name. But it's not. It's a very highly polite way of addressing a monk. So anytime you talk with a monk, please talk with reverence and politeness by saying bante. Okay, friends, just as a foot footprint of any living being walks can be placed within the elephant's footprint. And so the elephant's footprint is declared the chief among them because of its great size. So too, all wholesome states been, can be included in the Four Noble Truths. As I keep reading the, four, the different suttas, I start seeing the Four Noble Truths more and more in each sutta. It's kind of like it's hidden, but it's there. So it gets to be kind of fun to read the suttas and find out where the Four Noble Truths are. It's a, it's a good fun exercise. What are the Four in the noble truth of suffering, in the noble truth of the origin of suffering, in the noble truth of the cessation of suffering, and in the noble truth of the way leading to the cessation of suffering. <clears throat> Excuse me. And what is a noble truth of suffering? Birth is suffering, aging is suffering, death is suffering, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair are suffering. Not to obtain what one wants is suffering. And it seems to me that that's, a, that's the standard way of talking about the first noble truth. But I always put Getting what you don't want is suffering. And it seems like it should be added into that, but that's just my personal opinion. The five aggregates affected by craving and clinging are suffering. Uh, 
And what are the five aggregates affected by craving and clinging? They are material form aggregate affected by craving and clinging. The feeling aggregate affected by craving and clinging. The perception aggregate affected by craving and clinging. The formation aggregate affected by craving and clinging. The consciousness aggregate affected by craving and clinging. Now, the five aggregates and the four foundations of mindfulness are a different way of saying the same thing. And it says that in many other suttas. So, and what is a material form effect, uh, material form aggregate affected by craving and clinging? The four great elements and the material form derived from the four great elements. Every one of the elements has the elements in it, but just to different degrees. And that's why you have the difference between hot and soft and, and uh, so on. And what are the four great elements? They are the earth element, the water element, the fire element, and the air element. In Chinese medicine, they say there's five elements, and they put space in there. But space is one of the four elements. There's just more of one than there is the other. So the earth element, and what friend is the earth element? The earth element may be either internal or external. What is the internal earth element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is solid, solidified, craved and clung to. That is head hairs, body hairs, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, sinew, bones, bone marrow, kidneys, heart, liver, diaphragm, spleen, lungs, and large intestines, small intestines, contents of the stomach, or feces. Whatever else internally belonging to oneself is solid, solidified, craved, and clung to. That is called the internal earth element. Now, both the internal earth element and the external earth element are simply earth element. Now, when people talk about the casinas, they are talking about uh, the Hindu kind of practice. It's a one-pointed kind of concentration. Unfortunately, it's mixed in with some of the suttas here. When the Buddha was talking about the different elements, he was talking about the five aggregates and, and so on. So it's a little bit different. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. Oh, I, I, um, you may know or you may not know. I, I did the Earth Casino for uh, about six weeks. And I could do all kinds of interesting things with it, but I didn't see it leading anywhere, so I stopped doing it. So I really don't recommend doing the earth element unless you want, or any of the other elements, unless you want to learn eventually how to develop psychic abilities, walking through the uh, a mountain or diving into the earth and coming out, things like that. I had a student that was very, very good at that. And wherever I happened to be, she'd come and visit. 
And one day she forgot to take into account the uh, time change. And she called me at two o'clock in the morning or she came in at two o'clock in the morning. She was in my room. And I told her, don't ever do that again. I don't ever want to see you again. This is wrong practice and I don't want anything to do with it. So that was the last time I saw her. The thing is, when you start seeing things as they actually are with proper wisdom, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. Everything on the human plane is impersonal. Now, last week I talked a little bit about disenchantment. And disenchantment means, which is quite interesting, you, you lose your emotional excitement about things. Okay. Now, it doesn't mean you still will uh, keep your precepts or you can still do other things. It's just that you don't have the emotional attachments to them. And I was watching a basketball game on, on television and there, there was great stuff that was happening. These guys are truly athletic and they're, they're wonderful to watch. But I started noticing that I didn't have any emotional thoughts about the game, about who won, who didn't win. It didn't matter. And that's because disenchantment. And I've watched other things and, and um, done some things with some suttas. And I see that I, I don't think about what I'm doing. I just do it without any disturbance. So I, I can be walking along. I might have some thoughts about what I'm seeing or feeling at the time, but I don't have any habitual chatter going on in my mind. And there's so much relief on that. So it's just an observation that I'm giving you about the advantages of getting into the higher jhanas so that you can actually experience this. It's good fun. When one sees it thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the earth element and makes his mind dispassionate towards the earth element. That just means letting go of all emotional stuff. And that's that way with every one of the elements. Now there comes a time when the water element is disturbed and when the external water element vanishes, when even this external water element, great as it is, is seen to be impermanent, subject to destruction, disappearance, and change, what if this body, which is craved and clung to by craving and lasts for a short while, there can be no considering that I or my or mine or I am. So then if others abuse, revile, scold, harass a monk, who has seen this element as it actually is, he understands thus, this painful feeling born of ear contact has arisen in me. That is dependent, not independent. Dependent on what? Dependent on contact. When he sees that contact is impermanent, that feeling is impermanent, 
that perception is impermanent, that formations are impermanent, and that consciousness is impermanent. And as mind having made an element, its objective support enters into that new objective support and acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution. This is a natural outcome of disenchantment. Now, if others attack that monk in ways that are unwished for, undesired, disagreeable, by contacts with fists, with clods, with sticks or knives, he understands thus, this body is of such a nature that contact with fists, clods, sticks, and knives assail it. But there, but this has been said by the Blessed One and his advice on the simile of this all. Monks, even if bandits, excuse me, were to sever you savagely limb by limb with a two-handed saw, he who gave rise to a mind of hate towards them would not be carrying out my teaching. That sounds pretty radical. But when you have disenchantment, you're not going to be pulling up hatred and, and revenge and all of these other things that are attached to unwholesome states. So tireless energy shall be aroused in me and unremitting mindfulness established. Unremitting mindfulness means observing how mind's attention moves and gets caught up in things. My body shall remain tranquil and untroubled, my mind collected and unified. <coughs> now let that contact with this clod, sticks and knives assail this body. For this is just how the Buddha's teaching is practiced. That doesn't mean you don't get out of the way of those sort of things. You avoid them as much as possible. But if you see someone else being attacked, you get in the middle of that. And that, that attack will stop. When that monk thus re, re, recollects the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, if equanimity supported by wholesome does not become established in him, then he arouses a sense of urgency thus. It is a loss for me. It is no gain for me. It is bad for me. It is no good for me that when I thus recollect the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha, equanimity supported by the wholesome does not become established in me. One of the protections that I've practiced, and I've practiced three months of reciting these nine times a day, I got pretty good and I could, I could re go through uh, the beads very fast. And I could do the nine rounds of that in about 10 minutes. That means that I was very skilled at that time. I've since not done it so much, but it takes longer now but not that much longer. It's maybe 15 minutes instead of 10 minutes. When you recite the good qualities of the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha, fear will not arise in your mind at all. This is the advantage of doing this practice. 
an interesting thing happened to me while I was doing the good qualities of the Buddha was an image apply, uh, uh, arose in my mind of the Buddha shaking his head like he was agreeing with what I was doing. And I got real excited by that. I thought that was really something. And it was. Just as when a daughter-in-law seeks her father-in-law, she arouses a sense of urgency to please him. So too, when that monk thus recollects the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha, if equanimity supported by the wholesome does not become established in him, he arouses that sense of urgency. But if, when he recollects the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha, equanimity supported by the wholesome becomes established in him, then he is satisfied with it. At that point, friends, much has been done by that monk. The water element. What, friends, is the water element? The water element may be either internal or external. What is the internal water element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is water, watery, craved, and clung to. Now, this set of water elements are the things that when I was doing uh, the foulness of the body meditation, which should only be done with a teacher. Uh, it always, my body always disgusted me. When I got to this point, it was real easy to be, oh, why do I want this to continue? This body is full of so many foul, bad smelling things. Anyway, bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears, grease, spittle, snot, oil of the joints, urine, or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is water, watery, craved, and clung to. This is called the internal water element. Uh, when I was teaching a bunch of college students, they were 20, 21, 22 years old, and their hormones were really starting to act up, and they started complaining about the uh, lust coming up in their mind. So I told them, the next time you see a beautiful person walk by, turn them inside out. Tell me how beautiful their pus and blood and snot and oil of the joints are. Oh, what a lovely liver you have. I haven't seen a set of intestines like that for a long time. And what happens in your mind is you, you lose lust. It just won't stay anymore. <coughs> now, this is another part of the enchantment that happens, is you, you lose the lustful feelings. Now, both the internal water element and external water element are simply water element. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom. Thus, this is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. When one sees it thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the water element and makes his mind dispassionate towards the water element. Now, there comes a time when the external water element is disturbed. It carries away villages, towns, cities, districts, and countries. There comes a time when the waters in the great 
oceans sink down a hundred leagues, 200, up to 500 or a thousand leagues. There comes a time when the waters of the great ocean stand seven palms deep, all the way down to one palm tree. There comes a time when the water in the great ocean stands seven fathoms deep, deep down to one. There comes a time when the waters of the great ocean stand half a fathom deep, only waist deep, only knee deep, only ankle deep. There comes a time when the waters in the great ocean are not enough to even wet one joint of the finger. This is over a huge long periods of time that this happens because everything is changing, right? The only change there is in the universe is change itself. It sounds really profound, and it is. But try to try to try to tell me one thing that doesn't change. Oh, my everlasting love for my mate. That changes sometimes in one day. Everything is in a state of impermanence. And because of that, it's really unsatisfactory. It's really, it hurts. Everything is changing. This is one thing that uh, a lot of religions, they are looking for something that is everlasting and never changing. So they say, well, God is that way. But the only good definition you can give to God with that kind of a philosophy is God is impermanent. Interesting. Even when this external water element, great as it is, is seen to be impermanent, subject to destruction, disappearance, and change, what of this body that is craved and clung to by craving and last for but a short while? There can be no considering that as I or my or I am. So with others, if others abuse, revile, scold, and harass a monk, who has seen this water element as it actually is, he understands that everything is impermanent. At that point too, friends, much has been done by that monk. <coughs> the fire, no friend, what is the fire element? That's heat, cold. The fire element may be either internal or external. What is internal fire? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is fire, fiery, craved, and clung to. That is that by which one is warmed, ages, and is consumed. And that by which what is eaten, drunk, consumed, tasted, gets completely digested. One of the things that scientists and doctors over a millennium have tried to figure out is how to slow down the heating process in the body so that you can live longer. Of course, they haven't been able to do it. They talk about well, there was this one guy one time where well, I don't believe that either. So the thing is, heat is the cause of your being born, growing up, getting old, and dying because of the heat. 
What's the cause of heat? You know? Craving. Well, uh, as a baby, I can't control whether there's heat or not. Well, yeah, you can, because in your past lifetimes, you broke precepts. And that's why we keep being reborn over and over and over again. Until we run across somebody like a Buddha that can explain this to us in a simple way to understand. That's the key. Okay. <clears throat> now, both the internal fire element and external fire element are simply fire element. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom. Thus, this is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. When one sees it thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the fire elements and makes his mind dispassionate towards the fire element. Now there comes a time when the external fire is disturbed. It burns up villages, towns, cities, districts, countries. It goes out due to lack of fuel only. When it comes to green grass or to a road or a rock or to water or to a fair open space, there comes a time when they seek to make a fire even with uh, cock's feathers and hide pairings. When even this external fire element, great as it is, is seen to be impermanent, subject to destruction, disappearance, and change, what of this body which is clung to by craving and clinging and lasts but for a short while, there can be no considering as this is I or mine or I am. So then if others abuse, revile, scold, harass a monk who has seen this element as it actually is, he understands thus. This too is impermanent, subject to change. At that point, too, friends, much has been done by that monk. Now they keep on saying monk, but it's everybody. Too many times people think that because you put on robes that you're going to be a different person than they are. No, you're still a human being. Every human being is the same. And they still have these four elements. So when you hear monk, think person. Because it's always a different kind of person. What, friends, is the air element? The air element may be either internal or external. What is the internal element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is air, airy, craved, and clung to. That is, upgoing winds, downgoing winds, winds in the belly, winds in the bowels, winds that course through the limbs, in and out breath, or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is air, airy, craved, and clung to. This is called the internal air element. Now, both internal air element and external air element are simply air element. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. When one sees it thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the air element and makes his mind dispassionate towards the air element. 
Now, there comes a time when the external air element is disturbed. It sweeps away villages, towns, cities, districts, and countries. There may come a time in the last month of the hot season when they seek wind by means of a fan or bellows, and even with strands of saw in a dipped fringe in the thatch, not stirred. When even this external air element, great as it is, is seen to be impermanent, subject to destruction, disappearance, and change. What of this body, which is clung to by craving and lasts but for a while? There can be no considering that I or my or I am. So when others abuse, revile, scold, and harass, a person who has seen this element as it actually is understands thus, this too is impermanent. At that point too, friends, much has been done by that person. <clears throat> Friends, just as when a, spare, uh, when a space is enclosed by timber and creepers, grass or clay, it becomes termed house. So too, when a space is in, enclosed by bone, sinew, flesh and skin, it comes to be termed as material form. If, friends, internally the eye is intact with no external come into any range, there is no corresponding consciousness engaged. I talked with a Japanese uh, senior monk, he was actually quite famous. And I said, uh, do you think that persons, if they're blind, if they have no eyeballs, they're out of their head, can see, does that does consciousness still able to arise? And he said, yes. And I said, you have to explain that to me. It doesn't make sense. And he couldn't, but he didn't change his view. That just shows you how stubborn some people can be when they hold on to a view that they think is right. So be fluid, be able to change. Don't be afraid to say, oops, I made a mistake. I do that all the time, you know. And it's okay. That's a mark of, of a good person. Showing that you are able to be flexible enough to give up ideas that aren't quite right and accept other ideas that are right. And this is done by your own experience. This is why I keep telling people, you are your own teacher and you teach yourself from direct practice. And I'm not saying that Direct practice is sitting in meditation. I'm saying direct practice is life. That's why I wrote the book, Life is Meditation. Meditation is life. There's no difference between the two. If internally the eye is intact, external forms come into range, but there's no corresponding consciousness, conscious engagement, then there is no manifestation of the corresponding section of consciousness. How can that be? What happens if there's no light? That's that it's still there, but that consciousness can't arise. See how simple this is. But when internally the eye is intact, external forms come into range, 
and there is the corresponding consciousness, conscious engagement, then there is the manifestation of the corresponding section of consciousness. How simple it is. But why do we try to keep making things complicated? That's really a good question. The simpler it is, the easier it is to understand, the deeper your mind goes in that understanding. It's like I, I read a sentence that there were words no more than four letters long. And as soon as I read that sentence, I understood it completely. I knew that, yeah, I know what you're talking about. But it's kind of funny when you go to college and you have all these, quote, learned people that really don't understand much that use great big words that you have to have a dictionary with you to find out what the heck they're talking about. That's just a waste of time. It's a waste of time being around people like that. So, <clears throat> the material form in what has thus come to be is included in the material form aggregate affected by craving and blinging. Now, what's the difference between a regular human being and an arahant? The arahat has no craving arising ever. Still has the five aggregates. He still feels things. But his mind is so disenchanted and dispassionate that it doesn't cause him any kind of suffering. Although physically there might be a lot of suffering. In his mind, it's all accepting. Sounds to me like that's worth working for. And this is the same with the feeling aggregate, perception aggregate, formation aggregate, and the consciousness aggregate. If he understands thus, indeed, is how there comes to be the inclusion, gathering, amassing of things into the five aggregates affected by craving and clinging. Now, this has been said by the Blessed One, one who sees dependent origination, sees the Dhamma. One who sees the Dhamma sees dependent origination. Simple statement. Whoa, deep. When I ran across this, when I was writing my first book on uh, the Anapanasati Sutta, I was truly amazed how people would read that and go over that and they didn't make a, a comment. It's like, this is the most profound thing in my whole book. And you're taking it like it's everyday knowledge. Amazing. And these five aggregates affected by craving and clinging are dependently arisen. They don't arise if there's not something else there to egg it on. That's what dependent origination is about. And when you attain Nibbana, there's no more becoming of anything. There's no arising of anything. It's a different kind of state entirely. You don't find me getting much into discourses about dependent origination or about 
Nibbana and how it's supposed to be. Listen, what's there to talk about? It's unconditioned. I only have conditioned words to talk about it. How can it even make sense? The desire, indulgence, inclination, holding based on the five aggregates affected by craving and clinging is the origin of suffering. The removal of desire and lust, the abandonment of desire and lust for the five aggregates affected by craving and clinging is the cessation of suffering. At that point, too, friends, there is much done by that person because he understands it. Friend, internally, um, the ear and the eye and the nose and the tongue and the body and the uh, mind. If internally mind is intact with no external object coming into range, there's no corresponding consciousness. Then there's no manifestation of consciousness. If internally the mind is intact, external objects come into range, but there's no corresponding consciousness then there is no corresponding consciousness. When internally the mind is intact, external objects are in, in range, and there is a corresponding consciousness, then there is the manifestation of that consciousness. The material form in what it has come to be is included in material form aggregate affected by craving and clinging and the feeling and the perception and the formations and the consciousness. He understands thus, this indeed is how there comes to be the inclusion, gathering, amassing of things into the five aggregates affected by craving and clinging. Now, this has been said by the Blessed One, one who sees dependent origination sees the Dhamma. One who sees the Dhamma is sees dependent origination. These five aggregates affected by craving and clinging are dependently arisen. The desire, indulgence, inclination, holding base on the five aggregates affected by craving and clinging is origin of suffering. And the removal and abandonment is the cessation of suffering. At this point too, friends, much has been done by that person. Now, it doesn't mention the fourth noble truth because that's how you get rid of it. And how do you get rid of it? The six R's. The six R's are the fourth noble truth. Isn't it fun how things are interconnected and interwoven? The actual meaning or one of the meanings for sutta in Pali is weaving together. I like that. Because you can, you can make a truly magnificent rug by weaving together all of this knowledge that you've got today. It's that simple. It's that easy. And you'll notice more and more how your face becomes more clear, more bright. And people will, strangers will even come up to you and say, boy, your face is really bright. Yeah, of course. 
Okay. That is what the Venerable Sariputta said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Venerable Sariputta's words. <clears throat> so, that was a fairly quick sutta. Not even an hour. I should pat myself on the back for that. <laughs> Do you have any questions? Any comments? Anything? Yeah. Hi, Bonte. Uh, thank you so much. Um, you so I did have a question. Um, in right before it goes to the water element, it talks about um, he aroused a sense of urgency. Yeah. Right, and it and it refers to it in the same sense of urgency as a daughter-in-law who sees her father-in-law. She arouses a sense of urgency. But this is the urgency that we're supposed to arouse right. in seeking out and understanding dependent origination and understanding right. the impersonal nature of everything and right. understanding the impermanent nature of everything, right? right? Right. And then at the end, or almost like at the end of every paragraph, it says, at this point, friends, much has been done by this person, right? right? So it means that this person is doing this, right? Because and they're seeking it, they're following through, and, and they're working every, hard to get there. And everybody that has experienced at least one time in their life, a jhana, they are able to do that. Now, to get to disenchantment, you have to go to the realm of nothingness. But once you've experienced that, you're that way for the rest of your, your life. And it's, it's really kind of amazing. I, I ran across a few uh, Aborigines in uh, Australia. And they would sit sometimes six and eight hours, not moving. Their eyes were open. They were very much alert. Their mind was quiet. Oh, I like being around them. Because they had really good focus. They had a perspective of life that's so much different than people who break precepts all the time, who have active minds. Who wants to be around somebody with an active mind? That there's so much relief being with people that have a quiet mind. And you don't feel like you have to entertain anything although you entertain very easily and you laugh more because the ironic nature of things sometimes is really funny. So is there any other question or comment? Yeah, great. Okay, thank you. Uh, you mentioned just near the end of your talk uh, and I've heard you say it before that the fourth noble truth is the six R's and I can fairly clearly see how we need wisdom and I can also clearly see how uh, it leads us to collectedness. So I'm just wondering if you can highlight for me more where the sealer comes into the six R's. You use the six R's to get into jhana. Once you're in jhana, your mind is pure while you're in that jhana. Okay. And that's where disenchantment, it starts growing and gets better and stronger as you go along the path. At first it takes effort, but then they get to a place where it doesn't take any effort. It's always like that. Got it, thanks. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. Hi. 
Hi, Bonte. Hello, Bonte. Uh, hello. Um, can I go? Yeah. Oh, there is. Okay. Um, regarding the dependent origination, feeling, craving, clinging. Mm -hmm. I heard from you mentioning and also from Sutta that after feeling there is this perception. Yeah. And can you please tell us more about perception? Because sometimes it is mentioned as just memory, it has some memory in it to name things. Well, it but has memory in it, yes. But I have the impression it feeds a little bit more into the craving, bringing kind of volition in it bringing all or is just naming things or no, pure name. no it, it just it just names the kind of feeling that arises oh this is pleasant this is painful okay now they use perception in different senses in the suttas oh okay. but when it, it's talking about feeling independent origination then it's only talking about the naming of the feeling. And because that feeling has occurred before, that's from memory. But it might be memory from other lifetimes. Who knows? Doesn't really matter. Okay. And that could direct the feeling because, I mean, so when something happened, a person may feel pleasure, may, a person pay, can feel something else, right? Depending right. on those memories. Right. Yeah, you've got it. Okay, thank you. Bente. Okay. Matthias? Hi, Bante. Thank you Hello. for the talk. Uh, uh, I just wanted to ask uh, what would you like to comment on the line by the Buddha that one who sees dependent origination sees the Dhamma and one who sees the Dhamma sees dependent origination. I, I didn't catch the first part of what you just said. Try it again. Uh, I just uh, wanted to ask like how would you kind of open this sentence a little bit? Uh, like, uh... I wouldn't. Yeah. I wouldn't <laughs> okay. open it any. It's, it's open okay. completely. Okay. Okay. Yeah, well, I last have to meditate on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it completely shocked me with these mm. very advanced teachers of meditation. They didn't take that as any particular kind of statement. Yes, it's a Dhamma. The Buddha said it. I agree with it all, all the way. Mm. They didn't take it as seriously as I did. I, I was, the first time I read that, I, I had to sit back for a while and consider it. That is one of the most wonderful statements I've ever heard. Mm. Yeah. I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. Mm. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Thank you. Michael. Monte. Great to see you. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right, great. Um, yeah, I would not be here had it not been the, um, you know, the pillar of your teaching, which is you are your own teacher. Right. Uh, you know, after years of looking outside, you know, to have that land on my ears has just been an awakening in and of itself and the oh, intuition wonderful. it is it's so wonderful yeah and um so the intuition you know is is uh as a result of course flowering and um one of the intuitions i want to share is that the first step of the six r's recognition for me resonates with the uh, phrase in today's sutta, uh, this is not me, I am not that, Right. Uh, this is not mine. Uh, th that's the recognition right out of the gate. Yeah. And, and, and the rest of the Four Noble Truths kind of flowers for me from, from that. 
That's a wonderful so way you. of looking at it. I like that <laughs> very much. Yeah. So to recognize right out the gate, to 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 you know begin to cultivate that that living a life that's where everything is not personal, non-personal, yeah. is, is liberating. You bet. <laughs> so you bet. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. Anybody Thank else? You. Uh, you know, wait, may I ask again, though, are there particular uh, suttas that led you to conclude in your journey that you are your own teacher? You know? Not, not that I can think of. Uh -huh. It just kind of accumulated and I kept on seeing, well, yeah, that's right. Or no, that's not right. Was, and I, was it, it just took it, me a long time to realize that. But I have a slow mind. Well, I do too. But uh, <laughs> that's why the beard is as gray as it is. But um, uh, was it not the, uh, when, when the Blessed One said, don't take my word for it? Find out for yourself. No, it, it, for me, it wasn't like that. That would okay. have been a, a bombshell for me if I would have okay. taken it that way. I see. But it was just over a period of time seeing the, how true that statement was. Mm. Well, I thank you once again. Jeanette, <laughs> take the mute, mute off. There Hello, you go. Bonnie. There you go. Um, Wonderful to see you again, my friend. Great to see you, and I'm in your retreat in a few weeks, so I'm really oh, excited good. about that. Next week, Next week actually. <laughs> um, back to um, what our friend said about um, being our own teacher. I remember a sutta that you taught us about a raft, and Buddha said, um, this is just the raft. And when you get to the other side, you don't need it and you don't need right. me and be your own light. And right. that was when you taught us that that's what really um, solidified that we're our own teacher. Cause Buddha said so too. <laughs> he says it a lot of times and just, I'm so slow. It, it blows my mind sometimes. It takes me a long time to figure things out, but once I figure them out, I have it. I understand it. When I was in school, my teachers thought I was uh, kind of slow. It takes them a long time. I had dyslexia. I couldn't copy from the board to my notes. I could never finish. So he's slow. He can't do this kind of work. Well, yeah, I can do the kind of work. It just takes me a little while longer. What can I say? <laughs> well, that's really challenging. Uh, I have the same issue. And um, I memorized my social security number wrongly. And it's oh, created right. a big mess. <laughs> <laughs> the office said, just bring every pay stub you've ever had and we can straighten it out. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm glad it wasn't too painful. <laughs> no, that's kind of worries me sometimes that it isn't at all, actually. <laughs> well, that's that's the, the miracle of disenchantment. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank goodness oh, it had good timing. <laughs> yeah, perfect. I could also say it's the magic of disenchantment. Yes. Because we're all magicians. We take unwholesome and make it wholesome. That's magic. That's really, really the truest form of magic. When you help somebody overcome their suffering and they start to be happy, what else could you call it except magic? And it's not your magic, it's you showed someone else how to develop that magic. And that's the biggest magic, I think. Oh, yeah, by far. 
Okay, anybody else? Bante. Yes. Arisila, I don't know if you remember me from long ago in Fremont. I think you do remember me. Yes, very, just, very vaguely, but yes. I just popped in after our uh, lunch offering. I wanted to say I've been appreciating your your uh, talks, your sessions. It has been very helpful. Um, and uh, keep it up. <laughs> well, I've been doing that for a lot of years now. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I was just at the uh, Thai temple Wat Budanasor and talking with the, the abbot. I said, oh, I see Vimala Ramsey online a lot. And, uh, and they also have a Zoom session on Tuesday night uh, where I'm going to help uh, at least this Tuesday. I've done it a few times, but uh, hope, I hope to come and see you at Damasuka. Oh, I, I would open, open arms. Oh, thank you. <laughs> May you be well, happy, and peaceful. I you want to come along. Okay. So be well and happy, all of you. And uh, this year is going to be a good year. Just feel it in my bones. So it'll, it's going to be interesting. So look forward to it. Okay. So let's share some merit then. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, 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 sadhu.